How many of your students, or maybe even you, could use these skills? You guys seen those before? What are those? Social emotional learning, yeah. This is kind of a catchphrase right now we're seeing a lot of. Um, I'm actually going to New York, I think, in a couple of weeks to go to a conference that's basically all about that. Interesting, though, that I'm, I'm heartened to hear this, the, the keynote speaker is Robert Sapolsky. Do you know who he is? That's a good ring. <laughs> yeah, Robert Sapolsky, you, have you heard of him? Robert Sapolsky is, an, is a, interesting, he's a PhD MD from uh, Berkeley, uh, no, he's from, um, no, not Berkeley, maybe it is Berkeley. Um, and he is a, he's a neuroscientist. He studies baboons, which translates really well over to students. And, but, the, but baboon studies, he did uh, studies on uh, what's called the HPA, the, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, on how we are stressed and how we respond to stresses. And he's speaking of, so interestingly, a neuroscientist is, is the keynote speaker of an ed conference. Well, you're gonna get a little preview of something like that here because we work in the field of neuroscience as well. What we're seeing right now, though, is, is a, a powerful need that we have just as humans is to develop social and emotional learning skills. Those skills, if left untapped, make it very difficult to reach academic uh, uh, kind of criteria, academic um, you know, problem points, academic areas. It's very difficult to get into math or English or reading if you can't control your emotions. It may be very difficult, especially in our reading class, if you have trouble with emotional perception, it may be very difficult to access that. Uh, emotional regulation and the opposite of it doesn't work really well in PE. Dodgeball becomes dodge kill, <laughs> right? Impulsiveness is kind of bad in any classroom. But people who do well on this test, it's called the TQ, and, and people who do well on this, they see themselves as, for example, uh, emotional perception, that they're clear about their own and other people's feelings. So I hope to God this is a spectrum, because I don't have that one right all the time. But it's what the concept is. People who feel uh, like they're doing these things well end up being high scorers on this test. Self-motivation, that they're driven and unlikely to give up in the face of adversity. Wouldn't you like that one? If you have kids that are that, they're a joy. Right? They're super fun to work with, because they'll come back up ten times to your desk. Well, I still don't get it. If you have someone that's low in that, you'll never hear from them. They will duck out. Social awareness, they're accomplished networkers with excellent social skill. Yes, please, we'll take those. But why is it though that some kids lag in these areas? How, you know, how is it that they can come to school, they could be in high school, and yet these areas right here are floundering horribly. These kids can act out, these kids may not show up to school. There's something's the matter that kind of causes this problem and our society hasn't been doing a really super great job of acknowledging this, and that's in part because they tend to look at you guys as the one who's gonna solve that by yourselves. You're one of the few mandated areas left, education being mandated. I worked in my career at the state hospital. I worked for the Department of Corrections. I was the head of the behavior services section. I ran that for 15 years. When I started, there was two of us in mental health for 14,000 inmates. You'll see why that's an audacious number, even just outside of what it sounds. It's kind of like, who do you work with today? Has anyone stabbed anyone? No, all right, moving down, right? The phone calls I got, I could tell you some stories about what things I had to respond to in those years. I worked just up the road here at the Oregon State Pen, the big one inside the town. It used to be way outside of the town, now it's kind of in downtown. And then the program grew from there to encompass all the prisons. We went from two staff just in my section to 100 in a section of my section. Wow. And so it super grew because it was super necessary to do this kind of work. So if those traits are important, would those skills be helpful to everyone? Sure. And you're going to hear about it later today. I think there's two other talks that you're going to go to or that you can, that you can go to that are on the topic of social emotional learning. Well, I think that's a fairly well understood topic, a fairly well understood reading. You know, why should we be kind of integrating these into our classes? That, that makes sense. But how do we get there? Maybe more of the trick. I, I know that there's never been a time in education where there's this awesome catchphrasey kind of cute little thing that we're all going to chant about for the next year and not really quite know what a growth mindset is. By the way, not neurologically supported, but I'm not saying that here. I'm not going to talk about growth mindset because I'll get on my soapbox. What factors influence high school dropout? What causes dropout? We need to understand the gap. We need to know where these services are not meeting. That doesn't mean the kid doesn't, I'm gonna use the kid to mean every kid that we work with, every person, 
I did this a talk similar to this in the, uh, at the GED conference. I had to change my words there because kid doesn't quite fit GED work. But uh, anyone that's in school, we have to understand where these services don't meet because there's this assumption that if you refer a kid out to therapy, that this kind of check mark, he'll do better. But yet at these conferences, I get a lot of that, and a lot of people going, uh-uh. <laughs> says, not, that did not do anything for that kid because it may be <coughs> lagging in what it's doing. It may not be the right thing either. But there are three factors that influence our ability to ameliorate these risks, and they're really clear, and they're super based in science. And then we're gonna look at a sample program. So to start with, let's get our numbers right. One in five kids, 13 to 18, have or will have a major mental illness. It's an axis one, diagnosable mental illness, usually requiring intervention uh, on a medical level, sometimes requiring hospitalization, but is a medical diagnosis. 20%, uh, 13 or 18, live with a mental health condition. 11% of youth have a mood disorder. This is from the National Institute of Mental Health, and the reason why they put that one in there is uh, mood disorders outside of a psychotic disturbance are considered our most powerful, you know, like our highest diagnosis, kind of the worst case. 11% have one of those. Uh, bipolar disorder is an example of a mood disorder. 11% of youth have a behavior or a conduct disorder, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. These are ones often that if you refer a kid with a behavior disorder to a psychiatrist, if this kid goes to the emergency room, he'll leave pretty quick, as they say that's a behavior problem. Meaning medicine can't touch a behavior problem, it's a learning problem, the kid learns differently. So we can't help with that. But it specifically means something here in Oregon because of this term conduct disorder. Conduct disorder in 2006 or 2007 fell below the line for OHP. That means that, that conduct disorder became an unfunded service by OHP, our largest provider of mental health services in the state. That means if the kid's referred and has a disturbing disturbance. A conduct disorder means that they may even get some joy or some pleasure out of engaging in things like cruelty to animals, or cruelty to animals, or cruelty to others. We're gonna stop funding the treatment of that. 8% of the youth have an anxiety disorder, and that can span anything from PTSD to OCD. Uh, anxiety disorder is an umbrella disorder that encompasses a lot of different disorders. 50% of lifetime mental health cases begin by age 14 and 75% by age 24. That means that a kid that you knew last year may not have had the symptoms they're having this year. In fact, the reason why I have so much fun now working in, in pediatrics, working with kids, is because it's fascinatingly different. It isn't set, it can change. We're very hesitant to use diagnoses like bipolar disorder, which works for us because we get to be all academic about it. Unfortunately, in the academic settings, it doesn't work for you so well because that means I won't diagnose them with something that'll get them the treatment that you'd probably like them to have because I'm not quite sure, I need to see one more bout of mania before I'll give them that, and then you guys have to go through that. On the, av the average delay between onset of symptoms and intervention is eight to 10 years. So probably after he's done or she's done with high school. The earlier the onset, the worse the problem, which means if you're seeing a kid in treatment right now, it's happened eight to 10 years ago is when they first started seeing them. How many of the kids you work with where they've said, since kindergarten, since preschool, he came out of the womb, right? That's that. 37% of a kid with a mental health condition at age 14 or older drop out of school. 70% of youth in state and local juvenile justice systems have a mental illness. I can attest to that, having worked there. That is where they go. That is our largest provider of mental health services. In the prison, if you were to jump to that for just a second, interestingly there, people of color are overrepresented in the disciplinary seg units and underrepresented in the mental health units. Because it takes someone to do that assessment as who's going to determine what it is. Is that a behavior? Or is that just think, a kid who doesn't show up to school, is he truant? Or is he having a school phobia? Well, how much money do you have? Right. You can see a doctor? Yeah, he's probably got a school phobia. Right. You don't have any money? He's truant. Call the police. Great mental health service. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in ages 10 to 24. This stat, I'm still never sure I get this one. 90% of those who died by suicide had an underlying mental illness. I don't know what the other 10% had, but I would be surprised if it weren't 100%. 
But if you think then back to this slide, if, um, oh, I'm sorry, back to this slide, if 37% of students who drop out of school have a mental illness, then 37% of that number, because that's how many drop out of school this year in the United States, are mentally ill. It seems like something we should do something about. But instead, all states are actually rolling back to mental health services. When I started in 1991, I was asked by the place I worked, which was the Idaho State School and Hospital, to go into schools and do interventions for kids who were at risk to drop out, asked to do anything, really. But the reason why they sent me is because there was a partnership between the state hospital and the school system that said, hey, we will get that kid services, even if it includes putting them in the state hospital, because if it's left to that and the kid needs it, we'll provide it. They got rid of that program, now it's just the Idaho State Hospital. So the school parts dropped off. Hillcrest, some of the schools here that we used to have for people with developmental disabilities, their mission actually was also to intervene in schools, to also provide consultation like I was doing in Idaho. But by the time I left the state hospital in Idaho and went to work at the prison in Idaho, we had dropped that service off ourselves. We found we were proud that we had served 383 student, you know, residents that year, and the year I left, we had served 180. That was a source of pride because we're able to filter those people out. It really shouldn't be a source of pride if you can just not treat somebody. That's kind of easy. <laughs> but it was seen as, good, we're not putting those people in the hospital. It's like the problem with that number is it's really more like 1,300, 300 in residential, and the other 1,000 was outpatient consultation we did because outpatient therapists didn't have the training that we had to work with these cases. They also didn't have the sort of end-of-the-road mentality that comes from working in places I've worked. You didn't really have a choice of not providing a service for the people we worked with. If you're on death row and you have a depression, we can't ignore you. I can't refer you out, so I'm going to have to learn how to treat depression in death row, which seems like they should kind of go together. <clears throat> but schools, so that's the community picture, so here's a school picture. 1.2 million students drop out of school each year. That's 7,000 a day, or one every 26 seconds. But before we go, whew, good, <laughs> that's all right. We then learned organs had 8,000 drop out last year. That's two full classrooms a day of the school year drop out of school in Oregon. So why do they drop out? Well, research tells us the history is 62% of dropouts had been skipping school at least once a week. Oh, before I say, if you guys care, this email up here, I should have did it again. Joel Enoch right here in the back. Joel's a teacher with us. He's learning design, we call him, in, in our program. And Joel will be happy to get you copies of my presentation. <laughs> and that's his email right up there. If you want it, we'll get you a copy of it. We had a kind of a snafu in who was printing what today, and I learned who it wasn't. Uh, so 62% uh, of dropouts had, uh, had been skipping school at least once a week. Now, again, interestingly, of that 62%, uh, there's going to be those that are truant, and there's going to be those that were that were, you know, the school anxiety, you know, having so, uh, school phobia or school anxiety or um, uh, school avoidance uh, disorder. Behavior, 25% of third, fourth, and fifth graders had been suspended at least once a week. So we can kind of predict these kids. We can kind of see them coming. More than 40% of dropouts had failed at least two classes. I'd be interested to know, what do you think for alternative schools those numbers look like? What number of kids in alternative schools had been skipping school, had been suspended at least once, and had failed at least two classes. 100%. I have a stinky suspicion we're talking about the same kids, right? And that these kids are presumed, in fact, it's always interesting to me, we, I, I spoke at this conference last year, and there was a group of kids, you guys, anybody here last year see that group? Yeah, the kids that got up in the talk, that was so awesome, they got up and spoke in the front of the classroom, and I really learned something that even myself, as I watched these kids, I went, alternative education, means the kid's alternative, not the school really. You know what I mean, the school is alternative, but these kids, they're not special needs kids. They're not alternative like the kind of standard would have it be in the community that we could take a kid who's, who has these problems right here, add some mental health issues to it, and they'll be well served in, in an alternative school. That may not be what that's for. It may be misunderstood. I don't know how many times we've worked with a kid that has significant needs. And I guarantee around that IEP table, the school goes, you know what we can consider? Let's think about that all that program just up the road, because I'm sure they'll be able to handle it. They're like, right, they have a ton more services and programs available. That's a good idea. Let's do that. So what we did figure out is whose problem it ain't. 
At home, we know that that's not school. So the home problems, you know, if the problem kind of uh, uh, encompasses the, the home, well, that's not school's problem. That's home's problem. And if it's a school problem, well, then that's not home's problem. That's school's problem. School needs to deal with it. The problem is there is one buddy, one person who's in the middle of those two, and that's the kid. This gap that exists right here is the difference between who's perceiving what and who's perceiving what resource to be needed at that point. Uh, for the families at home, they're going to be accessing medical uh, providers like me. And by, uh, by, by doing that, what you're really saying there typically is those services that an insurance company would pay for. Because we kind of have this idea in America right now that if your insurance company doesn't pay for it, you don't need it. If you need physical therapy, you'll find out really quick, no you don't. Not according to, the, not according to medical insurance. If you need a chiropractor, no you don't. You don't need that. If your kid is having trouble with uh, anxiety related to building friendships at school, the insurance provider might say, that's not our thing, that's schools. And they'll draw a line. In fact, if I want to get because we're a private pay organization, if I want to get a family in a situation where they won't have their money reimbursed, all I have to do is write Ed right next to it, say something about school, and they will stop the funding on that one real quick. Because that one, they're like, oh, hold on, our job is not to make sure the student is a student. Our job is to make sure they're not in the hospital. Because we keep raising that bar to be just below jail, just below the hospital. If you need that, we'll step in, but only to provide that service not others that might actually support the kid. So what we see out of kids who lag in this area, out of people who lag in this area, you could even use us as an example. You see this stop, top part up here, we see problematic behavior. This is kind of the, the, the top of the plant. This is the stuff that pokes out and that we can identify, but what's under that? Our deficits in things like self-esteem. A lot of the kids I work with would rather be perceived as tough than stupid. So they put on a cloak. And they will not be made stupid. They'll be made, they'll show you they're tough. And they will. <coughs> personal awareness. They, they haven't developed an ability to understand why they might be disturbing their neighbor. You know, they don't necessarily care. If when they stood up and walked out of the classroom, that shocked everyone and now, 10 people in that classroom are sort of mentally stumbling now and they can't kind of catch the rest of the class. Self-control is not a thing they do. Stress management is sort of like, are you kidding? We are really far away from that one. Resiliency is a necessary, but unfortunately very much lagging skill for these kids. We, we wish they were resilient. We would love them to build resilience, but resilience requires some things to happen. They need to have a supportive environment. I forgot to say anything else on that one. Most of the time, the kids that we're working with, the parents are over-accommodating. Sometimes the schools are too. But the parents are over-accommodating. They don't want to deal with that kid when he goes off, so they will not put him in a condition where he will. That means he's never going to be exposed to a situation where he has to develop uh, you know, some, some skill in the environment. They're just going to simply pull him out. The first thing that dies in mental health is social supports. You know, the kids that... That, that smacked others in the head on the playground. Mom and dad sometimes won't bring that kid back to the playground. When what do they need but 10 times a day to the playground? You need, maybe need to be within arm's reach of them, but they need to be at the playground a lot more, not a lot less. These kids don't go on dates. These kids don't go out. They don't have manners. Why? Well, they don't, why do you need manners if you're eating in your room? You don't need to have manners in there. You eat next to an Xbox. <laughs> Their attitude lacks. They have trouble communicating these needs. They may not display empathy. I don't know how many times I'm referred to a kid and they're pretty sure that kid's a psychopath <laughs> when he's really probably ADHD. <laughs> but they're pretty sure he's a psychopath because he doesn't display empathy. And we have to say, you mean reciprocal emotional response? That he can reciprocate what he sees? The problem is sometimes he is reciprocating what he sees. Mm -hmm. But other times when he's not reciprocating what he sees, he's not being trained. It, it takes training to learn how to do these things. Most of all, it takes motivation. If you picture your future as one way or the other as being bleak, does it matter then what I'm doing here in school? Probably not. So to be able to get to those skills, to be able to get to those social emotional learning skills that we would probably all admit are important and sort of serve as the foundation of being able to build a good academic career on, 
we need to understand neurodevelopment then. So we jump back to my field for a second. Oh, we know some stuff about neurodevelopment. We know that the brain develops in a hierarchical fashion. It's sequential in its growth. It grows from the brainstem to the forebrain. And that developmental step, you have to master the previous level before you fully attain the ability to go to the next level. If you can't control, we have some kids that if you can run, we run EGs and uh, galvanic skin response, these different types of tests on them, and we can see that their body temperature can vary during the day by plus or minus two degrees, which should not be possible, but they're not even regulated at a body core temperature level. Their behavior is obvious, but you didn't know that. They're not even regulated at that level. Then the limbic system. Limbic system is sort of the emotional processing center. It's the area where uh, uh, um, we, we kind of first come into contact with that next level up. So now that your body is regulated and you've kind of mastered being able to hold your hands and feet in time and space, then we have to move on then to regulating yourself. We'll get into this in more specifics in a second. Then finally, the highest level is cortical. The highest level is cortical, that, that, of thinking and planning. I was at a workshop a couple years ago over on the coast I was giving, and, and um, this parents had come all the way over from Portland to come to this workshop, and they had a, a little book that they, had been that they had made in school, and it was a little flip book, and they wanted to show me this book, and they said, what do you think of this then? Because we, we talked about similar things, and this is for a five-year-old little boy, and I looked at the book, and I just looked at it for a second, I flipped it a little bit, and then I said, can I show this to them? And they said, yeah, and I said, Look. So this is a little book, and I said, when I get angry, I, dot, 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 and you flip up the page, it says, remember these 10 things. And then you flip and it says, number one, I gotta keep my, and I started flipping through it, looking at all these little instructions. And I said, who wishes they could use this book, right? Of us, who thinks that when I get road rage, I don't think, okay, first thing after, where's my book? Hold on, let me find my book. Okay, first thing, if I could do that, I wouldn't have the problem. That's a cortical intervention on a kid who's expressing a brainstem or limbic level problem. That's not gonna work. You'll talk to him until he's blue in the face and he's not gonna do that. It's not going to help. Core strengths then, we have, I'm sorry, so the cortical level, but this is the most important part. Now see, this is where the two fields kind of like never the twain shall meet, because in neuroscience we say, attachment forms the basis for all human interactions. And then you say, well, wait a minute, didn't we just say a second ago that, I left my thing here, just, um, didn't we just say back here that the problem is that the kid needs these things right here. Well, if the basis for learning is they have to have attachments to be able to learn these things, if they don't have attachment, then how are they gonna do this? They can't jump from one to another. So we have to then understand that the strengths, that these strengths are built in a hierarchical fashion too, just like the brain, and it kind of makes sense. How are you gonna develop a skill before that part of your brain's running right? Attachment has to occur first. If we don't have a good attachment, we're not gonna be able to get into any of those social, emotional anythings with this kid. They don't have a connection to you on a human level. After they are able to form an attachment, then they have to be able to regulate themselves. They have to be able to control their internal behaviors. Only then will they be able to affiliate with others. Only then will they be able to sit next to someone who says a dumb joke and you don't reach over and smack them, unless they deserve it. So they have to be able to affiliate them. Then they have to have an awareness of others, that others being different than themselves is not a bad thing necessarily, not something to struggle with, that the girl sitting next to you has to mouth the words as she's reading it, and that just irritates the hell out of you. But she, if you get that awareness, over time, you'll be able to develop a tolerance to that. And not every time, but it's almost, if you don't have all of these, you're probably not a super great student. We used to have a term when I started that was called uh, um, educability. And it was sort of a pejorative term because it was meant that somebody in my field was going to tell somebody in your field that this kid was uneducable. <laughs> but the concept wasn't really that far off, probably. Meaning that if he or she doesn't have these core strengths developed, they probably very much are hard to educate. But not because they couldn't be educated, it's because you're probably educating the wrong thing. You gotta start much lower. You gotta start at a different level. And we don't really bend very well, especially once we start getting criteria and certain things you're gonna have to test for and certain things that are important. Those kind of fly way out the window with these kids. That has nothing to do with this. We're talking neuroscience here, just how the brain develops. 
So what we know then is that for these kids, and we're talking about the top 1% of the 1%, so if you take all the students in Oregon, you lay them out on a bell-shaped curve, and you take the top 1% of that group, then you take that group, do another bell-shaped curve, and take the 1% of that one, there's still 2,500 kids in that group. 2,500 kids of the mentally ill group that have these level needs. Those kids are gonna require some special interventions if we're wanting to actually reach them. Safety and stability has to be at the core of that program. They can't be, you can't threaten with something like, you know, if you don't come in tomorrow, you're gonna be expelled. <laughs> really? <laughs> for the kids I work with, school suspensions are an expected vacation, and they know how to elicit one of those. They don't know how to ask for it appropriately. I always ask in classrooms, if you have this program, and when the kid's bad, you send them out, then I say, well, then how does he get out if he wants to just go out? Well, we can't do that. Like, do you see what you just did? <laughs> really? All right. When I worked at the prison, I had a 16-year-old come in who had already tried to get an off, I'll be careful with my stories here, because I realize not everyone works in environments like I have. But they, this kid was after officer's eyeballs, and that's what he was gonna try to gouge out. And so he had been in a lot of trouble in jail. He's 16. So he comes to my intensive management unit, the supermax where death row is. They say, we got two kids coming in today, they're both 16, and I say, what? A 16 year old, yeah, is coming into Thunderdome? I was in the, at that time standing in water about ankle deep with rubber boots on, talking on the phone, going, who's what now? <laughs> You're sending this? When we, were, when we had programming that you had to work a level system, basically, and you had to do all these things to get out of that program, there was an interesting, that was before I started, when I walked in, I inherited that system, we got rid of it, and it was because of this. That's assuming one thing, <laughs> that you want out. If you don't want out, then I know how to stay. All I have to do is not complete that program. Well, the cops got savvy to that real quick, so they said, okay, in some cases, you don't have to complete your program to get out because we just want you out. Then the kid will say, then what do I have to do to stay? It's like, well, all you have to do is hit an officer, and that's what he said, and that officer got hit. And they're like, whoops, and you're like, you're assuming the dude wanted out. He's 16, he's not stupid. Do you think he wants to go out our yard at OSP right up the street here where I used to work? Our yard is 2,500 adult male felons at once. If you're 16, that is not a place you want to be. Is it worth punching somebody in the head to stay in a place where you don't have to be around them? Oh yeah. You just got your values upside down for them. So these people need safety and stability has to be at the core. Those kids did not feel safe and stable, therefore the program is gonna fail. You had to design something different. This program is gonna to have to be predictable. It's gonna to have to be patterned and repetitive. That's the way the brain grows. We say in neuroscience, neurons that fire together, wire together. <laughs> They've learned patterns. Right? Those neural pathways are set. I can't talk you out of a neural pathway. I can't try to say, I know you've been trained your whole life that this is a super bad thing I'm about to do to you, but I want you to sit through it, because I'm the teacher. <laughs> you gotta listen to me. You can't outdo neurological wiring. But to undo that, or at least to train a new one, you're gonna have to hit them with a lot of repetitions. That kid on the playground needs to go to a lot more times on the playground. And most importantly, they need to have some wins. They, they need to once in a while succeed. Think of how many times, and it's, what's weird, we don't get to tell them what success is. We had a kid that we worked with that ended up going to uh, Edison, to a school that's off of Jesuits campus, and um, he's getting great grades there. He was not impressed himself, he didn't say anything. So we're like, why aren't you happy, man? You're getting some good grades. And he went, see this one right here, I got an 82 on? Yeah, it's still on my dryer at home. I don't know where that grade came from. I didn't do it. <laughs> They were just pandering to him. They were just giving him grades. You know, the teacher was kind of working with him and trying to make something work out. That's over accommodation too. Last year I spoke at this conference and I talked about anxiety and the problem with over accommodating anxiety. If you treat anxiety as though it's a real thing, if, if I said there's a monster out there in that hallway and everyone goes, well, I don't wanna go out that door and we all go out this window right here. For some people, we just made the monster real. For kids who have a, a panic attack when it comes to going to school, and yet we're stuck every morning with this decision about whether or not they're gonna to go to school, it's just what condition they're gonna be in after they get there, they're not gonna be in any place to learn if they make it. Because right. you're throwing them into the place that's scaring the hell out of them and they still lack the skills to be able to do it. So it takes persistence and time to rewire the brain. Think of when you just get a little cut on the surface of your skin, epithelial cells, super easy for your body to grow, it grows it all the time, not a problem, right? Think of how much more difficult it is and how much longer it takes for your brain to grow a neuron, the most complex body in your cell. And then hopefully that neuron connects right, that one didn't, okay, that one's dead, now we gotta grow another one, another 90 days. 
This takes time and persistence to be able to do this because we can't speed the developmental cycle. I can't make it go faster. It's only how many times do we have. If we worked all day to have 10 interventions on this kid and not through anything we did, but nine of them failed, today didn't count. We often say, welcome to day one, but we're saying that like 80 days into it. Well, day one. We're still trying to get one day down where we get 10 of these things in with no problem. And that's gonna take relationships. And those you can't fake. You can't pretend a relationship. I can't pretend like somebody I don't. But I do have to be able to have situations where for these kids, they're gonna have to, we're gonna have to develop a relationship with them, no matter how unfun they are. And whatever our definition, luckily I've worked in some places with some really unfun people. So to me, all the kids I work with are super great because they're not trying to stab me. And so I like them. This means that we're gonna to have to do this in a neurosequential format. So social emotional learning may not be able to be accessed in all cases unless we're sensitive to the natural biological steps of how the brain grows. If we're not taking that into account, at least that 1% of the 1% will be underserved, but probably a lot more. I think our whole school system is based on chronology, it's based on time, it's not based on developmental sequence. You have kids in your class that you've known. Man, if that kid would have just had that class one year later, he'd be a rock star at it. Would have felt totally different. But because of how we sign him up, this kid's taking a class out of sequence. This kid needs to learn how to keep his hands to himself. He needs to be back in second grade for that class. But he might be a nuclear physicist in that class. So when we spread them out like that and we're able to adjust that, we see a lot of differences with these kids. But to show you neurosequential in pictures, this is neuroimaging of brain development. This is showing cerebral volume expressed in two different ways. This is cortical surface, the outside of your brain. And this down here is cerebral volume, just how big it is. This is gestational age 24 weeks to 40 weeks. You can see when we start here at about 26 weeks in a day, we have no sulci, the, the little convolutions in the brain. It's a completely smooth brain. It really is functioning more at probably the brain stem level. It's trying to get that little heart beating chest moving, flicking muscles, but it's all reflexive in, in context. It's not a, may not even be reflexive at that point. It may just be stimuli uh, affecting it. But as the brain develops, you can see here, within just a few weeks, now we're starting to get some sulci, some division now, some changes. By 40 weeks, we have to get a lot closer to what looks like a brain. But you're seeing it grow this way. That never stops. It sort of hardens up around 26. You've all heard that. It sort of hardens up around 26 but it really never stops. They've done neurosequential work with people in their 80s. So we hope it doesn't stop. Here's an fMRI, a functional MRI that shows movement in the brain. The brighter the color, the more uh, uh, action is going on there, the more energy exchange. You can see at one month, we have a cooled off little brain. Not much happening. At 12 months, completely different picture. Uh, one doctor has taken this even to the extremes. Have you ever heard of Dr. Amen? or almond, he does spec scans. For about 10 grand, you can get one of these pictures of your brain. <clears throat> That'll show you right where the problem that you're experiencing today lives, as if you thought it would be somewhere else. Did you think it was your depression was in your toe? No, it's that your light's up blue. No surprise, but people pay lots of money to see that picture, and then have them tell you to exercise and eat well, which I do recommend. <clears throat> but it may not be curative. But if you imagine functionally, not li literally, but functionally, we could do brain scans of some of the kids that we're having trouble with, and I bet they would light up this way. I bet you would see some, that one faced with a social problem, the brain looks like this. It's cool. It's not responding. It doesn't sense a threat. It doesn't know that what he just said to that dude is gonna get him hit. <laughs> he doesn't see that one coming because of what? She is fat. What's the problem? They're like, oh, you'll see. <laughs> So the steps then have to be understanding the neurodevelopmental process and neurosequential before we move on to these things. <clears throat> if this person can't control punching somebody who sorely deserves it, how are they gonna develop empathy? How are they gonna develop impulse control to resist that urge to hit someone? If they're neurodevelopmentally at a step that you don't resist things at. If you have kids, I remember my, my oldest when he was tiny, he learned the word no before he learned the word yes, which unfortunately for him got a lot of things he didn't want to have happen happen. You want another ice cream? No. Wow. <laughs> He's crying. You're like, well, you said no. He's like, that's the only word I got. <laughs> Emotion recognition. Some of us, that's still a trick to do. 
with my wife, I'm often wrong on this one. I'm like, I recognize that emotion as a different emotion. <laughs> that was why I was obviously wrong. Emotion management, that's what comes next. <laughs> when I should have done the emotional recognition, is keeping those emotions, in this example, from the recent family dispute in check. We have lots of kids that we work with. One kid called his mom a bitch and was totally surprised when she would not, in the next sentence, give him a card for Steam to play video games. What? I asked for this video game card, and I just, he didn't put two and two, like, you just called your mom that, and then you asked her for something? Yeah. And that didn't go over well. No. Okay. That's this, right? Communication, same, right? Assertiveness, not aggressive and not passive. Not saying, fine, I'll do it, when you really don't mean that, because it's not going to go well with these. That might work if you can tolerate some things, but if you can't tolerate some things, that's not going to go super great. You're, you should have said no. You should have been more assertive and actually said what you thought. Problem solving. Really, without these in place, it's really difficult to get to problem solving. How's this? You sit down next to him and you say, no, Johnny, why did you? Da, 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 da. Oh, you'll get an answer. But that may have no relation on what he does next time. He's learned that skip. I'm sorry. Who do I need to point me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I go now? That doesn't mean he gets why he's sorry. Or that in the future, he's going to seek to avoid that. He's going to seek to avoid you intervening on him, so he's going to seek not to get caught. But he's not going to seek to figure out why you're crying in the first place. So before we can get to these, and there's several talks here, I think I already said today at, at this conference that are going to be on social emotional learning. And to consider that certainly these are important factors and these are certainly things that we could design our classrooms in a way that we reach some of these topics. But my point is, is that without taking first into account this, this becomes nearly impossible to get to and becomes kind of a pipe dream. And I, I know again that there's none of those that's ever happened in in, in your field where they had just some kind of catch phrasey buzzword that's really hot for a minute and then nobody thinks about it later. We're not talking about one of the, yeah we are, we're talking about something that sounds great but it's hard to apply. It's hard to put it into practice in the classroom when I'm dealing with kids from a variety of developmental steps and some of them will have no idea what I'm talking about when I'm talking about emotion recognition. Man, I don't know when someone's mad. <laughs> that's not the only emotion. <laughs> so. There's a cycle here beginning. The kids need social emotional learning to be able to, uh, you know, to prosper in the world. There's lots of research that shows this. This down here, emotional IQ, strong research behind EQ. It leads to good health, it leads to self-efficacy, it leads to life satisfaction, personal achievement, the quality of your relationships. We've got tons of research that says, this is what happens when someone can do it. We know that. The problem is, I went to a, one of my favorite professors in grad school said, uh, it's a wonderful theory diminished by an ugly fact. And that's this, here's the ugly fact, this is the way the brain grows. We do need those social emotional practices, they're absolutely necessary for a good quality of life. But if you don't understand that if this kid has had an adverse childhood experience, you guys all heard that one now, A studies? Adverse childhood experiments done by Kaiser, Kaiser was not trying to be nice to us and figure out some way to help us. They were trying to figure out how to pay less money. And so they did this research to figure out what's correlated with illness. And they found, wow, there is one thing that correlates with everything. Smoking, pregnancy, later incarceration, mental health issues, cancer, name it, it correlates with it. Adverse childhood experiences. The higher the number of adverse childhood experiences you've had, the greater the likelihood for problems in all areas of life. And depending on how early you were exposed to that, what age you were when you were exposed to that, is where the dysregulation may go. So if you were exposed to this before you were ever born, because you live in a war-torn country, you live in a, a gang-infested neighborhood where stress and strife is a way of life, and you've been exposed to these chemicals through your mama who was worried about you, and who worried about her safety, and cortisol, a neurotoxin, flooded her body because you can't stay in an adrenal rush all the time. That runs out in about three to 10 seconds. You need something else, a longer acting one. So we use a fat soluble uh, neurochemical called cortisol. And cortisol is a neurotoxin. And it's like taking a knife and etching it in the brain. It creates a channel. And every time they're exposed to that or similar stimuli, that channel lights up and they go faster to it each time. They get quicker and quicker because they're learning of, to have an adaptive response to a maladaptive environment. So they see stuff you don't see. You want to be safe, take one of these kids with you. Some place is not friendly. They'll tell you what's going on. They're like a canary. You know, when that kid hits the wall, you hit the wall, you'll probably be okay. Why? 
They must have been exposed down here. The next thing that develops is the limbic brain, your feelings and your thoughts, your emotions. They're just on the concept of relational with somebody else. But again, too many negative experiences cuts off that part. If this is impactful enough, we call that whole thing developmental trauma. A new diagnosis that we don't like to use right now, we try to stick to PTSD, but PTSD doesn't really cover it for kids because, God forbid, any one of you get sexually assaulted. At this age, you would have the reasoning to understand that's a bad person and what happened was bad. But if you're a baby when that happens, you don't have that reasoning, so you come up with a different way to explain that. And it usually ends up blaming yourself a lot more. The younger you are, when these traumatic experiences happen, the more impactful there are because you don't have a narrative to explain what happened. You're raised without mom or dad around. When you're, you don't have a way to explain that. Your mom and dad don't talk to you now at your age. You probably have a reason to explain that one. You probably know what happened. Because finally, we get up to the cortical brain, the part of the brain that can think. And that's when we get to being able to do this type of learning. But if we haven't mastered those previous levels, these things become pipe dreams. They became wonderful theories with ugly facts attached. The ugly fact is, it is really hard to get to emotion regulation when your brain isn't functioning at an emotionally regulating level. So these are the first two. These are the first two risk factors involved in school dropout from a psychological standpoint, is that we're not talking about neurodevelopment. We're not understanding how the brain moves from motor and sensory input to attachment to thinking before we can use these thinking-based approaches. But there's one more thing that actually impacts us just as bad, if not worse, really. Has anyone in here had a kid that has been in residential treatment and then come to your program or been out of home placed before they come in? Then probably what they failed to do before he came to you was design a program to help with generalization. So this kid was trained to behavior in a particular environment. But it takes a specific training program to take that, that behavior that is learned in that environment and generalize it to another environment. That is not a natural process. You ever gone to, well, you, you ever gone to a workshop and gone home and done nothing about the workshop you just went to? Failed to generalize, right? You go take a class, man, that's easy, I know how to do that now. And then you're trying to show your friend later, oh, I don't know how to do the link. Well, you didn't have the prompts on the wall, you didn't have the you know, if you're learning how to fish, you didn't have 18 different fishing poles over here, and the guy go, no, 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 that, that one. Yeah, that's, that's the one. You didn't have that. That's scaffolding, right, up underneath there. Sometimes the scaffolding that's in these programs is permanently attached. It's not removable. That's not scaffolding, that's infrastructure. You're trying to take a behavior that's trained in an area with this massive infrastructure and trying to apply that same approach in this environment, you're probably not even trying to apply the same approach. You're probably applying something completely different, yet surprised that we get a weird outcome. But he was trained thing A in environment B, and then you're taking them to place C and trying to teach them D, and then wondering why isn't this working. Stokes and Bear define generalization, you know what, I'm not even gonna say it because they have such, such a long-winded one. It's this, a failure to take a behavior learned in one environment to another environment is a failure of generalization. An appropriate generalization is just the opposite. It is taking an, uh, that behavior trained in one environment and matching it to the next. To be able to do that, and again, think again here, what we're really talking about is alternative schools. These kids have failed to acquire a behavior in one environment, and so now we're gonna put them in a new environment, and they're gonna try to learn it there. Sometimes the new environment has appropriate infrastructure and supports that that can, that can go, that can work. Sometimes it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because it's failed to generalize. We know that generalization is a stimulus control problem. If you took any learning psychology classes, the stuff I used to teach in college, ABC, antecedent behavior consequence, the A really isn't A. In, in our scientific language, it's S triangle. I'm sorry, SD. SD means discriminative stimuli. It's a specific stimuli. It's like a red light at a, at a stop, you know, at an intersection. The, the discriminative stimuli that causes you to step on the brake is the red light. It has to be clear. In fact, they found they increased Rex by turning that on its side. Same color. But turning the stoplight on its side increased Rex crazy because it's not just color now, it's position. You flip it around and put the red on the bottom, green on that, people run right past it. Why? They fail to generalize. That simple for adults reasonably well socialized. 
is a stimulus control problem. The stimuli that control the target behavior at the training setting may not be present in the desired generalized setting. So the set that controls the behavior there is not in the other one. Kids that do well at home but not at school. Well, I just tell him, knock it off, and he does. I don't know why you're having trouble in your classroom. Like, I'm not you. I can't threaten him like that. It's not this. I'll spank his ass. Well, this yeah, doesn't help me at all. <laughs> stimuli believed to be controlling the target behavior may, in fact, not be the controlling stimuli. The stuff that we thought was doing it is not the thing doing it. That's not what's actually controlling the behavior. The controlling stimuli may be conditional upon other stimuli, which do not occur in the generalized setting. So again, I have a fun, amazing, engaging classroom, and I try to send them to your class. Why doesn't that generalize? Why can't they do what they're doing at their therapy program in that residential facility? Why doesn't that carry over to your school? Because it was never designed to. They're designing just like I did. Though I was the head of psychological services and then later behavior services, I never pretended like I'm doing mental health services for the inmates. I was doing inmate control. My job was to keep them under control. The prison did not care how well they adjusted or how well they were going to leave here. That was not our concern. Our concern was making sure they didn't leave there and they didn't kill anyone in the meantime. So to maximize the probability of a favorable outcome, and based on these three things, we know this thing. The intervention must be sensitive to, the ch to, the, uh, to children's developmental sequence. It has to be, it, ha it has to understand where's that kid at right now. The intervention must be focused on social and emotional learning. We know for them to be successful, they're gonna have to get those skills. And oddly, this is before we're talking academics. <laughs> Before we can get there, they have, to have, they have to be motivated in the first place. So they have to be able to sit and not hurt someone sitting next to them. Or they have to be able to sit and understand that when that teacher eyes well up with tears as she's reading a poem, you might want to put two and two together on that one and figure out what's going on in that poem that's making her eyes well up. I saw a great cartoon, uh, what was it called, something? Oh, it doesn't matter. It was a claymation cartoon. It was talking about a person with, with uh, Asperger's. And the cute thing was this little claymation guy is in school, and he's drawn a naked girl on this chalkboard. And the teacher sitting behind him mad, but he has this little book around his neck, and he has to flip through, and then he matches the face to the, what the lady's doing, and then he goes, oh, then he's in trouble. But it took him that long to get it. <laughs> the, inter the, the intervention must take place in an environment that is most likely to promote generalization between it and other environments the child will regularly come into contact with. If it doesn't do that, if, if this environment, if the, if the place for these 2,500 kids that may or may not be able to be in a classroom, if they have to be placed somewhere else, then that environment has to look like, has to mimic the environment of school, or they won't generalize any of these behaviors over. They're gonna come to, a, to an environment with a new set of behaviors, a different set, novel behaviors will occur because we have a novel environment. So we were working with a student that was in a private school, and he, had, uh, he wasn't doing well, he was failing the classes, and he, his own report was he felt like the stupidest kid at that private school. So I came in, they asked me to come in and do this intervention. So I came in and I was talking to them, talking to the school. I found out really fast, talk to the teachers, you get all the information you need. The teachers that were on this kid's acceptance committee when he was a kid never thought he should be there in the first place. It was only that kid's family's money that the school wanted. And the teachers were upset because some of them had kids with less needs than this kid had, and their, and their kid didn't get in, but this kid got in. So here he's at, he's at fifth grade, getting ready to go into sixth grade. Now they have to make a decision. Do they accept him into their middle school program? And they didn't want to accept him in their middle school program, but they didn't want to be the ones to tell the family that, so they hired me to come in and assess the program and determine why it's not going to work and why I should be the one to say, you don't want this program to the kid. But I came in with the mistaken impression that $15 million moved some resources around, and that was their gift to the school. So I thought, this is awesome. We're going to put a special ed program in a private school. <laughs> nope, that was not what they had in mind. They did want me to tell them to leave. And so when that had happened, the family had reasons why the kid couldn't really be in any other program. They knew people there, or they had paid for something on that one too, and they didn't want to go there. So they asked me kind of in desperation. They said, well, what would you do if you were in our shoes? And I was half teasing, and I said, if I was in your shoes? Yeah, I said, man, I'd make my own. <laughs> Jeez, you guys could be, with your connections, <laughs> we could be taking you know, marine biology at UC Davis. <laughs> you know, I mean, we could be doing anything. We're not limited. And they said, can you do it? And I thought, yeah, we can, and we did. We developed MindWorks. MindWorks is a program that is completely personalized to the kid based on their developmental need with goals in the social emotional learning area. But with, the, but with the ultimate goal that we try to get the kid back into school, but we're gonna work through all environments. We're not limited to not work with the school. One of the hardest things that teachers tell me is trying to tell a family who doesn't know that their kid has a mental illness or hasn't acknowledged it yet that their kid has a mental illness. 
they feel like they're broaching a big boundary right there by saying that. They feel like they're gonna get in trouble. So they don't wanna say that to the school. Also, I have then families who don't share with the school psychological evaluations. That'd be really helpful to the school because they don't think the school can handle confidential information very well. So these two are on the standoff. So with MindWorks, we start in this area of regulation. It is down here in this part of the brain. It is in the area of the, of, of the brain stem that is designed to, to, to regulate your body. There we're gonna use a nurturing environment. We're gonna have uh, internet security practices put in place at home. We're gonna use the community. We're gonna build rapport. We're gonna, we're gonna play with the kid. We're, just, we're gonna have it at the beginning where that kid is begging his parents. We've had kids that on Christmas break are knocking down the door to try and they wanna come back on Christmas break because we've made it such a positive environment. Let me tell you, you're working with a different kid if they wanna come in on Christmas break. It doesn't take that long to build that and now they're hooked. They get what it's about, just like other kids do, but they got it here in our environment. So then we can begin to try to generalize that out and try to grow that. Up here it becomes relational. We have a therapeutic milieu, nothing at the expense of rapport. We're never going to hurt this kid. We're not gonna make anything, he's never gonna have a bad day. We're gonna make sure it always works out. You know why? We control the environment. You would do that too if you control the entire environment. I don't have to worry about the girl sitting next to him going, Phew. that's not gonna happen in our environment. We're not gonna have that. So he, he's gonna have wins. This is a safe place. Because only then can we get up to the reasoning part, which is working on intent and meaning and expansion of understanding. So for neuroscientists, it's not about the specific subject. Those are all just different conditions which this organism is in that we're trying to help them cope with. It's not about the topics. So when we go to our interventions, I'm gonna get it, come back to that one. When we go to our interventions, choice time, project-based learning, math, this is out of 20 hours a week. This is what percentage these things break down to. Our largest percentage is gonna be on project-based learning, and then math, and then reading. But since we're not a school, why are we doing those topics? I mean, why, are, why is that our, instead of doing therapeutic mandalas and drawing in the sand, why are we teaching math? Because it has to, it has to generalize. If you come to my thing and we're doing therapeutic you know, circles and you're learning how to pray and contemplate, that might be well and good, but that may have nothing to do with coming back to school. I've got to put you in a similar context. You've got to try some math on and hate it with me. Actually, with Joel. And Joel gets all the hate, so that works out for me. I'm always a good guy. You want to play a video game? You need a break? I'll come in and help. So that then, though, so mimics those other environments that we can transfer the skills over. Now we work with school to say, now I'll tell you what, if you just did this, we were just talking earlier to Connections Academy about how they can do it, right? It, it's, it's able to do because we can design things that help us transition between those environments much more smoothly than what we currently do. So it has to be rapport based. So our program is warm, relational, and you don't understand the level of flexibility we can do. <laughs> when there's no rules, you can be absolutely flexible. Yes, we will go get an ice cream, let's go and we're walking up the street. <laughs> because today, that was the best we could expect out of him, and if we pushed anything else, nothing was gonna happen good that day. Joel has been to McDonald's more times than he wants to count, <laughs> because we're being flexible, because we're not gonna lose. So the project-based learning is just an example, but we're doing those things to really drag these kids in. One kid, we worked with his parents, we had to bring the parents in, right? We worked with the parents and said, hey, would, would you be willing to fund a computer if you built it piece by piece? If we could have every one of those pieces of his computer be earned through an academic output, they said, sure. So six months later, the kid had earned his own high-end video gaming computer piece by piece, and the big end of it was he got to put it all together. All of those were project-based learning, including assembling the computer. Uh, it, it's an exercise interest. We've also had a business. Joel had High Verbals, which was a, which was a, um, a program where the kids grew their own herbs and made their own lip gloss and stuff like that, and then made a website and sold it, and they sold it. In fact, it was doing well enough, it was paying for itself, is to go. <laughs> but man, once that kid's interested, it's hard to stop them. You know it's good when the kid's coming back the next day going, you know what I found out on the internet, there's another company that's, and you're going like, you did this at home on your own? It's funny, almost you can't stop them from doing homework then. Why, you just made it relevant. They don't know why they need algebra, but they do know why they need to know what their competition is in the herbal lip gloss world. <laughs> Academics that are personalized, they're developmental versus chronological. We're not basing it on what grade he is. That doesn't matter. If he's at third grade math, does it do any good to pretend like we're doing algebra? No. This kid we're talking about, he got, a, I think, as a B in algebra, and his sister, twin sister, without his struggles, got a D. 
Let's just tell you something. The school still says, no, we weren't modifying or adjusting that. We weren't making any, I think, a little bit. <laughs> dude, this dude with the 54 IQ was in your algebra class and got a B? Yeah. I, I, I don't think so. It has to match, though. These environments have to match. When we put that together, we get an entire program that fairly quickly can develop the kid in those social emotional levels to where now we can talk about him coming back to school. And then here's how we would do that. And we work those next steps with the school to make sure that that kid can then, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, earlier you talked about like predictability, stability, and I forget what the, uh, an impetitive. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're talking about flexibility also. And then yep. we struggle with that. We have therapeutic sure. staff who want to be incredibly flexible and academic staff who want to be patterned and stable. Mm -hmm. like how, do you, how do those two things work together? Sort of easily if you consider that you can't be rigid one way or the other. Right, you can't say that like, look, if he's a little bit uncomfortable with this, you have to stop. Oh no, true rapport, I can push. If we have a solid friendship, I can say stuff to you, right? If I don't have that, I can't. So if I don't have a rapport, I have to understand why that stranger across the street is not appreciating my feedback, <laughs> right? And on the other hand, I also have to know that if I'm too flexible and say, whatever you want, man, whatever you want, we'd only be playing video games all day. And what's interesting is that the kids that we work with you find that out really quickly that they don't want they don't want nothing, right? There's a term that they have the quiet bigotry of lowered expectations. That's the thing, right? These kids are very well aware. Of this one, when you gave him third grade math, he wasn't offended. He knows what level of math he's at. He's offended that you tried to scratch off third grade. He said the guy uses the black sharpie on that. And I can see what you had written. You think I'm stupid? Right. We got to fight now, <laughs> right? So that teacher was trying to do the right thing, but with one step of it not being genuine not being attuned, not kind of reflecting what that person's going through, without that it's not real. And that is always the trick, is where is that? It's kind of the Goldilocks, right? It's gotta be just right. It's gotta be not too much and not too little. Is that good? Yeah, it's answer. Good. Yeah. Because no one gets behind, he gets left behind, remember? That was what we were supposed to be doing. And that kind of got lost somewhere along the way. Because schools, I think, are asked to do everything. This requires a model that the community's involved the homes involved and schools involved. School can't be the place that does this treatment. I can't do this with 28 patients at once, right? We're one to one. We do this slowly. We expand from there. When they develop skills, they can show those skills and they can display them. Then we start talking about what class would this kid do well in in school. And then we fade back that way. We have these kids going to physical therapy. They're having to move their body. You wouldn't believe what little sometimes these kids can do. One to one kid where we can't get up off the ground. If he were to lay down, he's like a turtle. I can't get up. Why, he doesn't even have cross the midline movement ability. This is the research. If you want, uh, you can email Joel. All this stuff's on our notes. And there's a bunch of research that backs this up, and it really should be probably where we're going with this stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Joel, for the slides, I yeah. see that you're also videotaping. Are we able to access a copy of the, the videotape? Um, we'll try. I don't know how to do that yet. Okay. <laughs> but this will be up on our website later. Okay. It'll be on there, and Perfect. so you should be able to access it that yeah, way. Yeah, we can just grab the link yep. from there. Perfect. Good. And Thank if you. you look for it, sorry that I was like eating right now.